they're trying to get you to, you know, give give you all their money or access to your credit cards and things like that. They're not that way. Are we ready to go? Ready to go. Okay, so I've changed the title of this. So sorry about that, boss. Uh, but the idea, and I, it came to me in a nap this afternoon after I had breakfast, or this morning. Yeah, I know that's a really bad idea. <laughs> But uh, the idea that I thought of was Oops. that we would have 100 years of broadcasting before <laughs> that... Uh, really changed the title. I know, he's really screwing with me. <laughs> Keep on top of that guy. Skip, if he gets out of line, you, you're, you're close by. Uh, and Paul's on the other side, so we got, we got them all working together. So the, the main idea that came to me in a dream was is that what we're really trying to do is get hi-fi sound out of your vinyl records. Most people really have never heard how much really good music is in those grooves that uh, the engineers and the artists and the producers went to a lot of trouble to get something that sounded very good to the point of where it sounds like you're either in the room where they're actually doing the performance or recording, or they're bringing that into your room. Those are, those are two different ways of looking at it. Of course, it would be, I mean, we might be able to fit half of the Berlin Philharmonic in the back part of this hall here, but um, you're trying to create that illusion, and you really can't not extract that information unless you have a pretty decent turntable to do that on. The, uh, next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, hang on, hang on. Okay, Get give him a smack there, Skip. Yeah. Here we go. Can we run that? that that's the next slide, right? Uh, should be a YouTube video. Oh, a YouTube video? Yes. Click on it. Oh, you can click on it. Huh? Just click right on it. There was a little something I saw on YouTube I thought was kind of cute. Did you have it working on your... Uh, yeah. I don't see any control for it or anything. Really? Now, is the Wi-Fi working in here? Maybe that's why you're not getting it? Uh, I'm not connected to the Wi-Fi. It may not be working. Oh, so okay. The Wi-Fi is not connected. <coughs> okay. The there, there is no Wi-Fi in the hotel. Yeah, well, I kind of found that. a hot spot on my phone. Right. All right, well, we'll just skip that. Let's do it. I tell you what, let's just skip to the next slide. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Just give me a second to connect here. Connected and secure. All right, let's try it. See what happens. There's no internet. It would be great to be able to just rip these off of YouTube and stick them in their, your PowerPoints. It can be done. It can be done? Yeah, I didn't delve deeply Not enough into that. that. <laughs> but, um, is there a special control for the video? I tell you what, let's just move on to the next slide because that's right. just uh, that was just a little taste of uh, stuff. Maybe we'll use that again next year. Randy, tell, tell, talk to us about this though. What is oh, this was a uh, actually this video here is a some a mashup that someone put together with a song by a artist called Bill Lloyd, and it was called Best Record Ever Made. And so what this is, is just like a slideshow of people listening to music, dancing to their records, turntables turning, uh, uh, people it really enjoying the sound of vinyl records playing back on their it was, system. It was why the 60s were the 60s, all psychedelic, man. Yeah, man, <laughs> exactly. It's it really a cool montage of pictures and, I mean, it's actually a, a video, most of these videos you've probably seen, like, the girl from Bewitched, she's dancing uh, to the sound that, of the song that's being played. And uh, what was those, the Beverly Hillbillies? You may have seen that thing where they had the uh, people uh, doing bluegrass and they're all dancing. Jed's up there doing his little thing. So it was a very cute video the that they cloggers, had. Cloggers, yeah. Yeah, doing the cloggers. And everybody just, yeah, go get some. Get some of that corn liquor while you're at it. All right, on to the next slide then. There so, we go. How's that? All right, so why records? Well, interestingly enough, uh, during this time period that vinyl records have been around from like 1920 to about 1980, 85, we've had some amazing music that's come out. Certainly uh, some 
amazing jazz like Charlie Parker and Miles Davis. Some, uh, you know, the whole pop music thing basically came around. Rock and roll was all during that same time period. Chuck Berry, of course. Uh, we've also, while classical music's been around a lot longer, some of the most amazing performances have also been captured during that vinyl era and put up there. Um, some would argue that we're not doing quite as good in the rock and roll and the jazz these days. Uh, and I'm not really a hip hop person, although some people try to claim that I am. Uh, but uh, you're just hip. You're I'm just, <laughs> and I, but I can't hop any longer. I don't have the hop. I got the hip, but not. Sometimes the hips aren't working as well either. But at any rate, there is a lot of great music out there still on record, and we're seeing a huge revival, and has been for the last ten years, where younger people are getting into vinyl records and it's, it's a product that they can hold uh, it's uh, you know whereas a digital file you can't hold and look at the pictures and all that sort of stuff so next slide please so not all turntables are created equally I guess we all kind of knew that oh God, hold on Paul I'll send the CPR expert over in just a moment good yeah. <laughs> The reality is there are millions and millions of turntables out there, and the vast majority of them fall under this category. Yeah, and, you can buy them at Walmart. Yeah, and most of those, Customs. you can buy a Crosley, a 1939 Crosley, and that Crosley has about as much to do with the real, the real thing as this turntable has to do with this. So, yes. Crosley turntables out there, those are really more like record cutters than record uh, <laughs> players. So, but Excuse you, me. yeah. Is your um, microphone on? Is it on? Can anybody hear me? Hello? Hello? Yeah, it is on. Okay, so this volume's all the way up. Okay. All right, well, let me, I'll do it this way. So, uh, at any rate, what I want to try and help you do is figure out what not to get and hopefully push you into this realm here because uh, the quality that you can get from these records, as we said earlier, is really quite astounding when you've got your stereo system set up. Next slide, please. Oh, that's the previous slide. Now I got it. All right. So we basically have two types of uh, turntables that are out there, and as they made probably pressed billions of records, and right now they're pressing 24-7 at every pressing plant and building more pressing plants and building more pressing machines to try to cope with the number of new records that are being produced. A lot of them are reissues, particularly in the jazz world, and the sound quality on those are really astounding. Did you have a question? No, I actually have something to point out. They're actually starting to reproduce uh, Edison drums, too. Really? There's new music coming out on Edison drums. Wow, so everybody can get their vintage on, <clears throat> sounds like. So, all in one, the Thorens turntable here shown, TD-160. This was the last turntable I had before I moved up here. You can often find these, you know, like right out here at our flea market, but at other flea markets as well. This is a very good turntable. It's not quite the equal of this, but you can get exceptionally good sound out of this uh, for what was 20 years ago, not a lot of money. Prices uh, have really skyrocketed on these as people have been getting into uh, the vinyl revival, as it were. The Gerard uh, 301, I call that a component turntable because these are sold a lot of times just as the table, and then you would add the parts on, you know, i.e. a tone arm. This one pretty much came together all as one piece. Next slide, please. Okay, that was pretty thorough. So, the advantages of all the one, everything is matched. You don't have to worry about trying to find the right tone arm for your particular table, because that does matter. Uh, there, you know, there is plug and play, you set it up, plug it in, and away you go. And they're usually less expensive. Now, the disadvantages are the performances are not quite at the highest level of what you can extract from those little vinyl grooves that are squiggling across the surface of that record. Uh, when found, yard sales, goodwill, cuts down, mark meets, they're not always in the best condition. <laughs> you see this one here, a little sad, 
I think it's the tone. The, the head is a little, needs a little work there. Uh, they're not upgradable. Component uh, turntables, you can upgrade, you can get better arms on them and uh, that sort of thing. Parts are really hard to find for these things. People are rebuilding a lot of the parts, but just like in anything, the more expensive an item is, the more likely you are to find a, uh, somebody out there remanufacturing a part for it. Uh, this is particularly true, uh, there's a guy in, uh, right now he's in the Ukraine, so he's not really shipping anything, but he does a lot of uh, remanufacture of parts for some of these turntables. And the repair is expensive. I know a lot of people have heartache with this. They pay $20 for this, and then they come up and say, Randy, I need to get this thing working, because it's not working. How much is it going to cost me? Oh, around three to $400, and they're like <laughs> stroking out at that point. <laughs> but you'll see why it, it costs a fair amount of money to get these done. Or you can do it yourself and save the money, but you'll be spending a good weekend like I did and still didn't get it working. <laughs> Next slide, please. Oh, oh yeah, and for those of you musicians out there that run a Marshall stack and think you're special, this is kind of uh, the next level. <laughs> the Grateful Dead and their wall of sound. All right, oh, what happened here? Uh, Skip, I think he needs a, a, a poke or something. screens and uh, didn't like it. So some of the better turntables can, you can achieve these uh, come all in one. You can achieve pretty good results, uh, but the prices are starting to rise. And like I said, the TD160 has been showing a huge jump. When I first put this presentation together in 2019, uh, you could get one of these in good working condition, and this is a belt drive, for about $300 on eBay, which of course is one of your more expensive places, but uh, it would be a good working machine. I just was looking at those recently, and now they're running about eight hundred to a thousand dollars. Yeah, exactly. Don't, oh, there's a young guy having a stroke in the back there. <laughs> uh, but other examples that can be had le for less money are the dual ten and twelve nineteen models and the twelve twenty nine. Uh, the Empire turntable. Uh, they made a kind of an all in one that is often used as uh, they just yank their arm off and put a better arm on there. And then, of course, the one that all the DJs and you hip-hop artists in here, you're a hip-hop artist, right? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, they used a 1200 series turntable, so you'll see a lot of those out there. And they were made up until, I think, maybe the uh, early 2000s. You could still get them at Guitar Center. I think they were made longer than that. Even further up? They don't make them, they're starting to remanufacture, but they're really expensive now. 2016. Oh, you might be right. I know they were around in Guitar Center. You could still pick them up. Uh, oh, I want to say, like in the 2010s, it was probably about the last time I saw them. Uh, the uh, Technics. An excellent all in one turntable. Just put it on there, put a cartridge in there, plays nicely. You, and you can get really high, fi high fidelity quality sound. As I've heard over at your place. Huh? As I've heard over at your place. Yeah. And it, there's very little feedback with it, too. Mm -hmm. If you're going to bring it up, you need a turntable that's not going to give you a bunch of feedback. Exactly. And some of the, one of the ways you can kind of tell a good turntable from a cheap one, other than kind of knowing them, is by how much they weigh. If they don't weigh very much, they're usually not very good. Uh, next slide, please. So... One of the first turntables that a lot of people get into in the hi-fi, uh, when you really start getting into hi-fi, are the AR turntables. These were, I guess, in the mid-60s when they came out, something of that time period. And uh, that was my first real hi-fi turntable. The, the problem, though, with these is, is that this tone arm is really pretty crappy. And a lot of people have been trying to modify and put uh, better turn, uh, tone arms on them. Um, however, what I, uh, and the prices on these are rising, you see these around a lot. I don't recommend them necessarily. They use a hamster wheel for driving the, uh, the platter, and like I said, the tone arm is just, there's not a whole lot you can do with that. People do make uh, different aftermarket 
things that you can add to them, but they are not necessarily, I think you're just ending up spending a lot more money when you could just move on up to a much better turntable like the Therens TD160. Next, please. So now the advantage of the, the component turntables is you can match in sound quality the very best that you're getting buying today, for the most part, until you get up into the $50,000 turntables and the $100,000 turntables, which are really, ex uh, I don't know, they're really extravagant, I think. Uh, the components are pretty readily available. You can still find like these little tone arms uh, and people are remanufacturing these tone arms. The guy out in uh, Ukraine, he actually makes a copy of this gray uh, 208 and um, there's a large community of builders that are constantly taking these turntables and a lot of the component turntables are used in broadcast studios and so as, as a, as a uh, Necessity, they had to be a fairly high quality to be able to run as much as they did, as often as they did. Um, it's a lot of bang for the buck, I think, on those, and you can get really some of the highest fidelity playback in a, in a component system. Now, the disadvantage is some of the components are expensive, but some of them are, are really not. Um, and a lot of times, people, they're always chasing perfection. But when only the best will do, this is probably the way to go. Well, one of these tables, I got this part here at a mark meet at one of our radio activities, I think about three or four years ago. And it was $100. So, yeah, exactly. Nowadays, those echo uh, uh turntables are more expensive. But you do find these at Cutstown. And you will see them for 50 to 100 maybe $200 just for the table. You need a tone arm, but, uh, and they can be really transformed into exceedingly well-playing turntables. Next, please. So there are basically two classes of component turntables. Uh, the vintage community um, likes the ones that were made for the uh, average consumer such as the Gerard 301, uh, the uh, Thorin's T-124, which was, there was a, an example of that at Cutstown that went for a fairly reasonable price uh, with a tone arm. I think it was uh, around $1,000. And then, uh, the, once again, the Reco Cuts. And Reco Cut made a whole line of these tables, both idler drive and uh, belt drive. Uh, next, please. And of course, as I was mentioning, a lot of these are used in broadcast studios. I bought one of these, very similar to this one right here, from Steve McAllister, about four or five years ago, with the tone arm, the whole shebang. That was the one I was trying to also get ready for, the, for today that we could present, but we'll maybe not save that for another time. The only problem with these types of turntables is they were made for studios, they have a a washing machine motor uh, to drive the platter so they had to get those things up to speed quickly for the uh, DJ to get that record on the air uh, and they can often were only used in mono so that they constrain the rumble to be mostly in the vertical direction and less so in the horizontal direction so often they need to have some modifications to be able to be used in stereo and not have a lot of rumble uh, Exactly, they did. Well, the, they did have FM stereo in like the 60s and stuff, so they, there has to be some broadcast stereo turntables. Well, this is a stereo broadcast turntable. This tone arm oh, is, okay. uh, is almost always you find these as uh, stereo cartridges, usually a Shure M44 or, or a uh, Stan, uh, Stan 500. The, um, but what they would have is they'd have a low, uh, low pass cutoff filter to cut off the uh, low end so they could uh, eliminate the rumble. Uh, next, please. And they're beautiful. Those are just gorgeous tables. Can't wait to bring it in and show, show them off. So here is an example of American version. The previous one, of course, that was a Reco Cut. Excuse me, a Rusco studio model. This is a Reco Cut. A lot of people, you can buy these for around 100 bucks. And then you just need to find a ton of them to match up with them and uh, away you go for really good sound. Next, please. 
Here's the gates. These were used a lot in uh, broadcast studios, and uh, they're getting to be quite expensive nowadays, around $1,000, I think. The light. But I think, yeah. <laughs> Got the uh, shifter right there. Got the shifter right there. <laughs> Next, please. In Europe, they had some phenomenal broadcast turntables, including this example made by EMT. You can just see the build quality of this thing. Screams like, yeah, we can get some hi-fi out of this. Next, please. And the Telefunken, probably the ultimate in the broadcast uh, style of uh, turntables. And these uh, Europeans had very high standards for their music because they're playing on the Beethoven, on the Bach, and they need the wonderful sounds that we get from that. So uh, just a wonderful turntable. People in Europe are rebuilding these whenever they can find them. The only problem, and we're starting to see this, is uh, just finding them, because about 10 years ago, studios were just dumping all their turntables, so a lot of them ended up in landfill, but they still show up. Next, please. And here's our official mark <laughs> turntable. <laughs> so uh, you can see we had the separate motor, and we had this uh, Coupled so we don't get a lot of rumble in there. Uh, and you can actually probably make a pizza on there while you're at it. Uh, next picture. Did you finish a, uh, a radio one? Did you there think I was getting it? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> we have that at Radio History Museum. Uh, so it wasn't for real. I wasn't kidding. Next. What is that? What is it? That's, uh, that's, a, that's for real. That's a turntable. That would have been used, that was probably something that was used in a mastering studio or something like that. And now Mark uses it to play the 78s on, you know. Uh, yeah. It looks like a potter's wheel. Yeah, it wouldn't be a cutting uh, turntable. So uh, whenever you're uh, getting these component type turntable systems where you're going to buy a separate tone arm to put on them, there will be things that you have to be aware of that you want to use. A lot of these work much better when they're using vintage tone arms, and they can't, they not, they don't match well with um, the more modern tone arms that were made in the 70s and 80s because they don't have the mass. They can't really handle. They just don't seem to match very well with that. And so there are articles about uh, how to match up tone arms with particular tables. Uh, to get the best performance out of them. And this is just a little blurb about that. And they talk, I just mentioned how the broadcast turntables have been repurposed, and people are adding different tone arms to them, but most of them are going back to the original tone arms that came with those tables. Next, please. So here's an example of a couple of vintage tone arms. Uh, this is a gray 208, often used in a mono system. Uh, it looks like it's some kind of reject from a sci-fi film, but these actually, with the right cartridge, are quite good sounding in mono. Uh, the the um, Microtrack 303 wood tone arm, these were made to be idiot proof for uh, DJs, because the DJs would often use these, and because uh, they were in broadcast studios. But it's surprisingly a good sounding tone arm, and it works great with those uh, Rusco uh, type uh, turntables. Uh, another one, of course, would be the tone arm that, was, that came with Reco cuts, or that you could buy separately, and so you could put those on your Reco cuts. Not a bad tone arm, uh, mat matches well with those tables. Unfortunately, the prices on these, all three of these examples are really starting to go up. Uh, ten years ago, you'd pick, pick them up for less than a hundred bucks, and now they're like three, four hundred dollars. Except for this one, which is now hitting about a thousand dollars. Although the guy in the Ukraine, if his factory is still there, uh, is man remanufacturing one of these for about six hundred, and they're very, very well done. And then, last but not least, of course, is the Shure SME tone arm, which is uh, very popular. It's a very good tone arm, not quite up to the standards of what we have today, but matched with the proper cartridge, uh, these can give very good performance. Yes, sir? The one in the, in the upper right looks like it's made of wood. Is it is. Better? It is. Is that better than metal? Uh, I don't know. Some people like wood, and there have been more than just this manufacturing making them out of wood. Um, I think it's, it's kind of cool looking, and it does work, 
Uh, often you'll find these with cigarette burns on them because the DJs would just leave their cigarette on there while they're queuing up another record because they'd have a dual turntable set up. But um, these are actually, you would think that might not be so good. Maybe hum would get in there, but uh, they seem to work fine. And that's what I have as one of these on my Studio B. I do, exactly. I just fill it in with lots of creosote and you know other PCBs to uh, keep the termites away. So I see a little pile around there. I know I got to go look out also in the house to see where they're coming in from. Yes, Roy? What is it about the sound that makes it? If you've heard good sound, and Steve McAllister can, can join me here, it's quite transformative. I mean, you're listening. Your standard, and I would say 90% of people who've ever had a hi-fi, a stereo system will say, they play music on there and it's enjoyable and it sounds okay, but when you set it up, when it's set up properly and you have fairly decent components, it brings the performance into your room. It's like it transports you to where the recording was made if it was like an outdoor stadium or, or a big you know, performance hall. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, whereas, um, or it will transport you to the place that it was recorded at. And for me, I found it to be um, a situation where I will be listening to records primarily and be reading a textbook or something like that. And I'll get to the end of, of the page and I'll wonder, what, what did I just read? You know, because I've been really more focused in on the music. It draws you in. And it really does have this kind of three-dimensional effect. Can you add anything to that, Steve? Or Robert? You were in the industry, right? Yep. Yep. I have a question you say about the proper cartridge. Mm -hmm. Are you going to explain compliance and, you know, we're going to beryllium now for extreme lightness between the, sty the stylus itself. But that's a massive pile of tone on there. Yes. An object in motion tends to remain in motion. You know, and if, if it's going to warp a record, how does a, what kind of cartridge would have to be put in this kind of thing? And that's a very good point there. It's important to match the cartridge to the tone arm you're using. This thing probably weighs about the same amount as a Buick, you know, like a 50s Buick uh, Fender or something like that. Uh, and as a consequence, you have to be very careful in matching the cartridges to these types of tone arms. Some of them, like the, uh, the Microtrack, they can handle a fairly uh, compliant cartridge, but not a highly compliant cartridge, because the compliance is how much the, uh, the cantilever can move as, as it's moving throughout the groove. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't put a cartridge on this that sounds good, but you have to put the right one because if you have something that's really massive and the cartridge uh, cantilever uh, has high compliance, it's just fishtailing all over the surface of the record, whereas you need something that has a stiffer cantilever to be able to use a heavier arm. With a light arm like this, you can actually use fairly compliant cartridges, and more often they use a lot of these sure uh, uh, high tracking cartridges. Nowadays, they really make some light tone arms, and as a consequence, you can use uh, a cartridge with a higher compliance, and which will, which should reduce wear. But a lot of people will say that these don't necessarily wear out a record, even though they're bigger and heavier than a higher compliance uh, tone arm cartridge combination. But it is important, and that was something I, talk about, I talked about in a uh, presentation on cartridges, uh, about properly matching the cartridge and tone arm combination. So that, you know, you don't want to put a Ferrari engine in a, in a Volkswagen Beetle because you won't be able to control it. And the same thing would happen here. You don't want to put a, uh, like a Shure V15 Type 3 uh, high compliance cartridge in this thing because it would never be able to keep up with it moving in the grooves. Um, is there another question? Yes, Roy. Are, is, are the, uh, the force of the arm on the record, I don't know what you call it. The tracking force? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are they comparable to those? 
Uh, generally speaking, this uses a, a bit of a higher tracking force, usually in about the three to five gram range. Whereas this one here might use something in uh, 1.0 to 1.5, something like that. Probably a little heavy, more likely about 1.5. Um, but once again, surprisingly, a lot of people say that the, the groove wear by both of these will be pretty much about the same if you had the right cartridge. It's the mistracking that really causes the problems with records being worn out and uh, losing the uh, ability, uh, getting a lot of clicks and scratchy noises and stuff like that in your records, unless you like that sort of thing. Next. Some people do. Some people do. I mean, there was a, I saw somebody, he was just grooving to the sound of, uh, of the swishiness and the clicks and going like, oh, I just love that old vinyl sound. Well, guess what? When they were doing the old vinyl sound, they actually um, didn't sound like that at all. They really did and can sound quite excellent. So uh, this is kind of one of the turntables that started this rush towards uh, taking uh, vintage turntables and making them into high-performing high turntables. And there's a guy named uh, Jean Latai up in Canada started this. This particular turntable is actually a fairly inexpensive turn turntable. He has a different arm on there. But this was the Lenko, which was made in Switzerland. And um, he did some modifications. And a lot of times the modifications are nothing more than you know going through cleaning up the motor, making sure the bearings are good, uh, the rubber mounts and the idler drives are still supple. And sometimes it might require uh, a little more effort than that. One of the big things is, is that they build these plinths, the support, which is not here on this turntable, uh, are usually fairly heavy. And that's to act as a sink for the vibrations that are traveling, that are being picked up by the tone arm and being synced into this big hunk of wood, basically. And that does seem to make a big difference. Everybody seems to be doing that. And there are hundreds of people making these plinths uh, primarily in Eastern Europe and selling them on eBay. Next, please. Hello? Yeah. Oh, you're there. Okay. I, I didn't see you move. I thought I just want to make sure you're there. So, uh, once again, just talking about the uh, Gerard uh, combination with the SME 3009 or the 30012. Great combination. Um, a lot of this information is another website. If you're getting into turntables and stuff, Lenco Heaven, named for the Lenco turntable, which is also sold in the U.S. under the Bogan brand. Uh, that's another great spot if you want to uh, find out more, learn about modifications, and uh, or how to bring an old turntable back to life, like the one I got from Steve. To, to mention that again, that's a great table. I can't wait to get that totally up and running. And that was, I think I paid $100 from it. Steve was so nice uh, to do that. But it, it is going to require a good bit of time to get that going. Uh, and uh, once again, the Gray 3 uh, 208 tone arm. It does look like something that uh, you know, they might have used uh, in an old Hollywood movie, but these are very common in the broadcast uh, booths and uh, stations, and they actually, with the proper cartridge, like the early Shures that went, that went stereo or the mono cartridges, work quite well, and they will not damage the records playing them. Next, I think we're getting close to the end. Okay, and these are some examples of some plinths people have built, and you can see they can be quite stylish looking. Uh, Thorens TD-124, which, uh, these are getting expensive. Gary Alley has one of those, as I recall. All right, Gary? You have two of them. Uh, I like a man who keeps a spare you know, in case something goes wrong. Uh, this is, I think, a more modern turntable here, maybe a Riga planer or something like that uh, with a Lynn uh, arm. Beautiful workmanship there, but most people are taking these more plastic or small, thin wooden uh, plinths and beefing them up, and it is an, an improvement in sound quality. Next, and uh, once again, talk, uh, talking about matching the turn, tone arm to the turntable. This is a typical uh, idler drive uh, reco cut, hundreds of thousands. They're still out there, and you can usually find these fairly cheap. 
Uh, these work really good for mono because they've designed it to, to where most of the rumble is in the vertical direction and not in the horizontal direction. When you go to use these as a stereo table, it becomes a bit more problematic. You've got to do some uh, pretty significant rework to get it working, but it can be done. And you can see here, once again, this guy built this fire engine red plinth, nice big heavy plinth to uh, support the turntable. Next, please. And these are sounds that are played in heaven. Two of my favorite performers, Billy Holiday and Lester Young. For those of you who don't know, you need to go listen to their records. Next, I think that was going to be something played, but we got a little, is it 11 o'clock? 10 after. 10 after? Okay, if we've got, we can do one of two things. I have an article on how to rebuild the um, Thorens TD, uh, I'm sorry, not Thorens, the Dual 1219, like I said, very common turntable, very good performance. Dual 1219, Dual 1229, Dual 1019. Those are all great little tables that can be gotten fairly inexpensively. That doesn't mean every dual turntable is any good. The Garrard 301, one of the holy grails, uh, but the other Garrards that are out there are pretty much crap. So <laughs> they made a lot of tables for a lot of different price ranges. But you can get a good table, a good all-in-one table, fairly inexpensively. And uh, if we want, you can either ask questions uh, or we can go through that, you know, what it takes to get one of these up and running. And by uh, example, th that same thing would apply to a lot of other turntables that you would work on that would be these all-in-ones. Or, or, you know, if you would rather go out and start five o'clock early, we can do that too. <laughs> so what would you be your prefer preference? Would you want to see a little bit about what goes into restoring one of these, or would you rather ask questions? Yeah, no, you want to go through that real quick? One question, if that's okay with that. Sure. Um, in the component setup, how do you know where to locate the arm versus the turntable? Most of them came with, if you're, uh, most of them came with some kind of cutout with that tone arm, and it would show you how the distance from the spindle to the tone arm, what that distance needs to be. And so, uh, and you'll often find these little geometric goodies in a place like Hi-Fi Engine or Vinyl Engine. They also had those uh, old Konaki tonic, but the vertical drive one, where the tone arm doesn't swing, it actually slides across the record. Yeah. And they want to have, like, some of them put the record vertically and they actually hold it, and the, the tone arm goes like this, so they have it either like this way. Yeah, those uh, vertical tracking, or not vertical tracking. Uh, yeah, yeah, those basically uh, are not very good. There are very few of those uh, tone arms like that that track how it was, the record was cut that are any good. One of them, though, is the, I think it's the Rabco that was made here in Maryland. I lived in Silver Spring. And those are actually pretty good, but they tend to crab across the record. And that's the problem you get. You get perfect tracking for a little while, and then it starts as it has to uh, make the sensor drive the motor. It will tend to crab across. And so unless you get those just right, they uh, have a tendency to introduce more mistracking errors. Yes, sir? I have a technique that I got for free on free cycle. Uh -huh. and it, it's uh, one of those parallel tracks. Mm -hmm. Linear tracking. It, it right. will not skip on any piece of crap record I put on there. It just, it just, it really worked. Now, I don't know how the sound quality is, mm -hmm. but my hearing screwed up anyway. So. Okay. <laughs> a lot of people say that their hearing screwed up. It couldn't be any worse than mine. I played in a rock band for like about 20 years, and I still play in that. I think I'm deaf in one ear, and I can't hear out of the other, but I can definitely, the sound quality can make a big difference, and I can distinguish, you know, between a well-recorded and pressed record as a, you know, hunk of junk. Yes, Roy. Can, can you compare uh, generally uh, direct drive versus belt drive versus idler drive and any other kind of drive? And what kind of drive do the very best turntables typically use? Sure. Um, 
I threw drives were the earliest ones. Those were the earliest ones that they uh, learned how to make, and they showed up, you know, all the way back into the 30s with the little Pilco beam of light type of uh, turntables. Uh, those were kind of phased out because of the rumble characteristics of the motor being coupled, the noise of the motor being coupled by the idle wheel into the rim of the uh, platter itself. Now they eventually went to uh, belt drive to reduce that uh, effect, and that really shows up in the AR uh, XA turntable and the Empire turntable. And that became kind of the standard for hi-fi uh, turntables. And then later on, of course, direct drive came out, and the really good direct drive turntables were used in recording studios and in broadcast studios. Uh, the direct drives do have the problem, although much less so now, of cogging as the motor is fluctuating, going from you know one little magnetic field to the next, to the next, to the next. And some people say that that can be sort of heard. <coughs> Uh, but with the better ones, the planters are really heavy, and so you have the centrifugal force that keeps the thing uh, continuing to rotate uh, at a constant speed. Uh, right now, what people seem to like in the hi-fi community are idler drive turntable, going back to the beginning. And it's said that the sound has a more immediate sound to the recording. I don't know what that means exactly. <laughs> I don't get that, but a, a dual 1019 for a direct drive turntable in a package has got to be one of the most incredible pieces of... No, you're talking about the techniques. I'm sorry? You're talking about the techniques? No, of the I'm talking about the dual t uh, 1019. They oh, 1019. Those are either drives, aren't they? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I'm saying that there, it's an incredible turntable for mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah, and the 1219 is basically an updated version of the 1019. So, you know, once again, that's a turntable you can get fairly cheap. That is an idler drive and really does sound good. But uh, going back to your point, there are people who are dedicated um, direct drive fans. They say that it sounds better. Some people still like the idler drives, and you'll find those in master, you'll find both in mastering studios. You don't seem to find as much in the way of belt drive. Those are kind of falling off. They're easier to make, but uh, and they seem like they would transmit uh, less rumble from the drive, but uh, they just seem to have lost a lot of uh, popularity. Although this, my main turntable is a, uh, a belt drive. It's a VPI, which is a fairly high and expensive turntable, and it's really a magnificent piece of engineering. Don't the direct drives have a, 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 like a strobe light thing on there so mm -hmm. you can tweak the... Yeah. And there's apps on your uh, cell phone where you can put it on the platter. And if it's not going too fast, it will read out the RPM. If, it's going, if you're trying to determine if it's doing 78, it might fling it off into the, <laughs> into the room. Yes, sir? Uh, how are records cut? With a linear moving head? Or yes. Yeah, they're cut with a linear moving head, and that's always been the big problem because most tone arms track in an arcuate manner, which means that there's only two points where it's actually uh, meeting the groove in the, with the same orientation with which it was cut linearly. So linear trackers should be the best sounding, but it's, it, but it's uh, there is so much other moving parts and things like that involved with linear trackers that it, uh, a lot of people say that that's really, they don't sound much better, if better, than an arcuately tracking tone arm. Uh, to eliminate a lot of that tracking error, they make the tone arms longer. You know, most of them like this are probably a 9 or a 10 inch, and they make 12-inch uh, uh, tone arms to kind of minimize some of that tracking error. Is there some kind of a measurable effect that you could predict from the angle being off a little bit? Yeah, you can actually see that in a protractor, because they do make protractors for setting these up. Because you have to move your cartridge forward or backwards within the head shell to get the proper match. Yes, sir? Did anybody make something with a laser pickup instead of stylus? Yeah, actually they did. But for whatever reason, it didn't really seem to go very well into the market. I think by the time they got to that, they got to CD shortly thereafter. And so, you know, they just eliminated that altogether. I guess it would be considered direct drive. I don't know what to call it. Is it I guess like electromagnetic drive, it's a type of direct drive, but the, the 
there's no motor. The platter is the motor. There's, a, there's coils when you have either like magnets or other coils in the platter itself. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it actually, a lot of them actually float. They actually, they drive on top of coils on the motor. Now, I don't really, but I remember the tumultuous start because they are really feeling finicky to get started. So you have to make sure you get them started correctly and they don't wobble or, and in some cases, if they went faulty, they fling the record across the room because it was yeah. actually, you know, How it's two separate pieces. So if it, if it wanted to come apart, wow. it would come apart. But I do, but they still see them on sales. They must have figured them out. Some, some of them even, you, you can get the platter to float like a whole like inch up off, completely separated from the whole base unit and it just, sits there and floats with the, the tone arm doesn't, of course, but right. the bladder does. How many of us, how many of you guys had to get your turntable moving by doing what he said? Give it a little push. So that the yeah, you have, you have, like a little <laughs> I think we all have. You have to put on it and then you have to get them get started and then once you get started, you basically, you basically just leave it on and it just idles and spins. You, uh -huh. don't, you don't turn it off, basically. I can imagine that must have been expensive. Yes, Paul? Oh, yeah. How do you classify an SL-1200? Uh, SL-1200, we uh, classify right up there as being hi-fi performance. No, but I mean, it's a Hall effect drop. Uh, is it? It's magnetic, yeah. There's uh, no... Well, all motors are magnetic, so any kind of direct well, drive. I understand, but I mean, there's no contact between the platter. Yes, no yes, that's right. Okay, but the platter is still, still spindled in to something oh, yeah. that rotates, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's a Hall effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess, I guess you would kind of classify it like that. I mean, obviously they've tried a different uh, number of different ways to do direct drive, uh, primarily with. Now, do you call that a direct drive? I would call, call that a direct yeah, drive. Yeah. Sure mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that would be. I would certainly consider that in that uh, yeah, ballpark. The is part of the motor. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, Robert. My buddy has one of those, and he asked me to put a new cartridge in it. And I brought it into my little shop and got the cartridge to work the whole line. And holy smokes, you turn that thing on, and boom, it starts the rotation. It's probably hitting speed within yeah. a tenth of a rotation or something. Mm -hmm. It's a third. So that's why they, they spec it as a, as a third of a, of a revolution. So that's why the DJs and stuff are. Mm -hmm. or the, Oh yeah, so exactly. The problems because when they first came out, they were everyone was poo pooing and saying, "Oh, they have problems starting. They won't, you know, yeah. all this stuff." But I guess you're right because I've seen seen them on sale and apparently popular enough. Well, they, they, they use a different motor mechanism now. Yeah, much more powerful, or yeah. Well, what they did is they the early ones. It was a conventional motor. In other words, the rotor was the rotor and the stator was the stator. And the entire unit was larger than the label of the record, which meant that your cartridge would position itself above the motor during the last few songs on the record. And a lot of cartridges didn't like to be near. Yeah, exactly. Good point. And so you, you had Tracking force increased by a thousand percent. Wouldn't, wouldn't be very noiseless when they were playing the last couple of tracks. And to this day, if you go into a high-end hi-fi store, they'll rarely play you the last song on the disc for two different reasons. If it's a direct drive cable, the, the cartridge is closer to the motor. And the second reason is because of the angle errors of the shorter tone arms, the tracking error increases towards the end of the record, generally depending on how you set up the arm. But back to the motor techniques, made the coils stationary. And what used to be stationary in the conventional motor, which would be the magnet structure, that is actually affixed to the platter. And there's a, a tiny set of coils also mounted on the platter, and that's kind of like the Hall effect uh, product of the motor speed control that he was talking about. So there's two elements on the platter of the modern techniques a ring magnet with multiple holes on it, and then in the center, a, a rotor. Mm -hmm. 
yes. with coil wire yes. wrapped on it, the it, and it rotates in the stationary coil. It makes the entire motor about this big around, yep. which is about the size of the paper label of an LP record, which doesn't have any <laughs> modulated grooves on it. So the yep. tone arm and the cartridge is automatically farther away from any magnetic disruptions, and voila, yep. you've got so a really good uh, turntable that you can find quite readily. You don't have to hunt for idler wheels. There are actually some techniques, machines that are automatic, like what you're speaking of on mm -hmm. tools. Right, oh, exactly. Here's an interesting thing. There's a model of 1650. Yeah, yeah, that's and it'll, hard. It it's drops hard. six like records. The, and it's a direct the, drive the, techniques. I don't know if yeah. you've seen it. No, I'm not familiar with that particular model. It came out it, it, along with the 1600, which was a semi-auto, mm -hmm. which means you pick up the arm, place it on the record, the motor starts turning. When the arm reaches the end of the record, it automatically picks up the arm, returns it, and turns yep. off the motor. That's semi-auto. Yeah. They made a, that was called 1600. Came out in the mid 80s. Mm. But they made a 1650, yep. which had a, a tall spindle like this. Yeah, like let's the move till we get to the pictures. And you could uh, stack six records on a direct drive. I, we're going to just fly through this real quick, and then you can ask questions at the end because we got another presentation coming up that we have to set up for. And we're it's at 12:30. We, we got time. Hey. Well, we don't want to put anybody to sleep. I see I, John's I see. already like. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, this is a document that I found on eBay. Uh, excuse me, on um, Audio Karma in their digital docs area, and it's about servicing these. 1219 uh, and 1229 turntables, which are fairly common to find. Um, and this is just uh, showing a picture. We'll just go through just the picture parts. You can download this and read it. So We're going to set this all up on the website. So. Yeah, you can do that, sir, certainly. So this uh, the idler wheel, you know, you have to check on this to make sure that it's uh, still good. It has this little rubber retainer in here for removing it, cleaning the uh, idler, maybe even re getting it rebuilt if it's in, got flat spots or whatnot. That's one of the steps. Uh, next, down to the next picture. And this is with the, uh, obviously the platter removed and they've also removed that idler wheel which attaches here. That is to work on this part here. Whenever you see these turntables, if this is not moving, you're probably in good shape. Because what happens is it's a grease that's in, that was used in these uh, auto turntables. And a dual is called a dual because it's both auto and it can be used both in automatic or it can be used in manual. And if you try to force this, it will snap the plastic collar in there. If, you, uh, if it's turning freely, you need to check to make sure that plastic hasn't been broken. This one here turns freely, but that's because it's missing a couple parts in there. So, which are pretty easy, just a ball bearing and a, a spring. Uh, next picture, please. And so this is uh, the speed control mechanism right here for switching between 33, 78, and 45. And this is the little part that rotates and moves this up and down to give you the different positions on the uh, spindle that will therefore drive it. So first thing you have to do, take this apart very carefully. There's the uh, uh, spring right there. This one's already been done, you can tell, because it's got white lithium grease on there. But uh, originally this, plus this plastic collar here, which can be broken if somebody tries to force it, is filled with, it's got a lot of this amber grease, which is turned into amber, uh, because it's just so damn hard. <laughs> Next picture. And this is where he's taking apart the control mechanism, and there's a the little spindle that you saw. There's the ball. There'll be a spring underneath there, so when you're taking it off, you've got to be careful that it doesn't pop off and go into the darkest part of the universe it can ever be found. But these are, you know, these are just ball bearings. You can get them at a hardware store if you know the diameter. All filled with this amber grease. Next. And so this is showing you as you slowly start taking it apart, all the greasy parts. Next picture, please. And just some more breakdown of it so you can see. Make sure you take lots of pictures if you're going to try and do this yourself. I would normally charge at least $300 if we do one of these. Next. 
and he's just showing you the breakdown and how you have to take this apart. All this in here is just filled with this. It seems more like Loctite than Grease by this time. Next. And this is the, what moves the spindle up and down. Next. Yeah, this is the picture I wanted to show you. So here's your little le lever, collar, uh, C-clip indicator. You can see all of these different parts here that make up this. And it will probably take you, uh, for the first time, a couple hours. Once you get used to building these, you can do, usually do them in an hour, but that's just covered in grease. And it has to be torn apart, and it has to be cleaned out, and it has to be re-oiled and re-greased, uh, usually with uh, wheel bearing grease, uh, like the, the red lithium wheel bearing grease. It has just enough tackify to it, while also providing the lubrication that you need to make these work properly. So that's part one. Keep going. What do you clean them with? Uh, usually I use uh, IPA, and no, I'm not talking about uh, yeah, a, double, a double IPA or something like that. That's the part I clean myself out with, but normally I use like a 91% you know, uh, isopropyl alcohol for cleaning these up. You can remove a lot of it just by wiping it, but where, you, where it is kind of thick in there, you, will have, you can use an IPA to help get that out. Be careful around any rubber parts because that can eat some of those away. It's just showing this. Keep going. Uh, once you got this, next thing to do is take the motor off. These have a fairly substantial motor on them, and it's just just showing you how to do that. Uh, next, please. And uh, keep going. That's just showing you how the orientation of the wiring goes in there. Make sure you take lots of pictures. Keep going. And so this is the motor removed. These rubber mounts in there, you want to make sure that the uh, rubber motor mounts are not dry rotted or something like that. Next. This is a dual 1219? Yes. The, dual, the reason I picked the dual 1219, I've done a number of these, they're, they're a bit of a bear to restore properly, but you can find them fairly cheap. This will be probably the cheapest high fidelity turntable that you'll find out in something like this. But a lot of what I'm showing you can be applied to other turntables because they, they use grease. A lot of them are, are uh, you know, automatic or changer styles and this grease just gets really hard and it has to be cleaned out and lubricated. When I worked at Music Technology, I had one guy, that's all he did, tear these turntables apart, re-lubed them, and he said, gotta do it all the way. You just can't half-ass it. The one that I got here, the 1218 actually, somebody tried to half-ass it and they just poured oil all in there to try and lubricate everything, and that just made it a dripping mess. You had to clean out all the motor oil where they should have just taken it apart and cleaned it properly. But it's time, and time is money. Uh, so, yeah, here's the motor taken apart. You uh, re oil these. These have little cotton pads inside them that hold uh, 10W30, and then that will run pretty good once you clean out everything. Next, please. Can you use the 75, uh, 100 mile one? Um, <clears throat> I use casserole myself, being English. And here's the fun part right here. So, yes, this is where it gets interesting, taking all these linkages apart. Every linkage surface here has grease, and this little uh, plastic rim thingy that controls everything, that's a very technical term, uh, that has... Um, tons of that grease which just locks it up just you can look at this example here uh, later today and uh, see what's all involved that is not a lot of fun taking that apart and you've got about six different linkage systems that you got to take apart just to get to this but once you do that and clean it out this runs very smoothly the only problem is making sure that this pin arm here, which is attached also to the tone arm, is properly located within the grooves here. Uh, let's move to the next picture, please. Yeah, this is showing you know, all the cam linkages, and this will just, the grease in there will be just, you know, really uh, just all oxidized and hard, and it won't allow this to move. Again, you're using acid grease on that? Yeah, I use that red lithium uh, bearing grease is, that they sell at uh, Auto Advantage and any other place. Yep. I think I use Fran. <laughs> Next. And then I put that in my axles of my uh, 280Z. 
<laughs> and then this, and then we get to the fun part. One thing to note: this is part of what holds uh, the tone arm and has to get working. And if you don't get the orientation right of this with this stuff in here, then uh, this will not allow it to go up and down. And that's why I'm stuck right now on the one that I'm rebuilding, uh, which is why now I got two of them, and I can look at where I made my mistakes and hopefully figure that out, get that right. There's a little ball bearing thing that's underneath here. This is dry rotted out and has to be removed. People do remand those so you can buy them. One thing to note when you're working on this, here's your tone arm wires. Do not do what I did, which was to clamp all of this together right over top of the tone arm wire and cut it in half. <laughs> so beware, there's a little area underneath there where the slide's underneath. I missed that whenever I reassembled it, so I had to rewire it. Uh, next picture. So this is taken out of part and just showing you the Sawyer nipple. These usually have to be replaced. People want to remanufacture these. Uh, and also the grease for this uh, axle here and then back in here. Uh, next. He's just showing you some more pictures. See, you can just see this ugly, hard uh, grease, and that just prevents this from really working properly. Next. And uh, here's where he's taking off this collar here and the ball bearings. Next. And this is his jig that he's made to replace. Uh, he replaced this with a new one that you can buy, and he kept the old ball bearings. This is just a, oh, excuse me, this is the replacement. And this is just a jig that he's made up with some tubing to slide those over. Next, and uh, he's showing you here some more of what needs to be done. This thing here often needs to be replaced because it wears out and then this gets exposed and uh, it will not allow it to operate properly. Next, so there's a replacement for that part there, and there's a replacement for that part there. Of course, we've re be, uh, degreasing all this. Next. I know we run through this fast, and you have to make sure this is in the proper position and locked in with this axle. Next, so that it glides in there after you've cleaned that out and added uh, your fram bearing uh, grease in there. Is that acceptable? <laughs> Next, so now he's got this all back together, and we're not home yet. Next, keep going. Uh, yeah, this is just the, what well, raises is tone arm here, so this has to be cleaned out, taken apart, and the old grease removed and new grease put in next. And then at this point, here, this is where I got stuck. This tube right here has the lift pin for lifting tone arm up and down, both automatically and manually. And that needs to be taken apart, cleaned out, and then put new uh, oil in there. Next picture. And so he's showing you some of the techniques for doing that. Keep going. Yeah, there's the pin and how you take this apart and then clean it out and put the new oil in. Uh, 6,000 center stokes uh, is recommended. Next. This is such a popular turntable and there were so many of them made that they're very common to find and people remanufacture. And this guy put this together, some guy up in New Jersey, really knows the stuff on these turntables. Next picture. And um, because he can perform and you can get them fairly cheap, uh, it's been worthwhile to do this. Next, and there's uh, the lift mechanism there which gets taken apart and cleaned out. Next, uh, and there's this, the diff oil that he uses for that so that it lowers at the proper speed, it doesn't just drop like a lead balloon. Next, keep going. Cleaning up underneath there. That's pretty much, I think we can probably stop there because we're getting way over time. But um, that just goes to show you how much work, how much time you have to put into one of these. There are, these directions are pretty good and if you take lots of pictures along with this, you can pretty much do it yourself. I mean, I was able to do it pretty much, still working on it. But um, if you see something like this, and you, you're moving up from a, you know, a, one of those crosses you bought over at Walmart, um, this would be a good uh, turntable that was a good, and these will run pretty good high-end cartridges in them, and they will sound, uh, will give you hi-fi sound, which is what we're all about. Yes, sir? You mentioned that the signal from this can go into the Apple price. Yes. But it's, uh, it's, I mean, we don't have this, but 
Yeah. Mention the raffle prize. Okay, so the raffle prize out there is a pair of KL8 speakers that uh, John has donated. That is combined with an ICO ST70 stereo tube amplifier, which uh, for those who saw my rebuild uh, thing a couple months ago, basically did the same thing. All new power supply caps, all new electrolytic caps, all new film and foil uh, coupling caps in there. It's got a um, CL80 in there for current inrush limiting. All the tubes have been tested. Everything has been shot and cleaned. It works and it sounds like a champ. It is a stereo tube, 35 watts per channel, pretty heavy piece. That is a high fidelity quality amplifier. Um, it's not a Marantz. You're not gonna win a Marantz at this price, not yet. Maybe if I get two of them, I'll put one in. But uh, as a raffle prize to get you going towards high fidelity, that amplifier will certainly be a big step in getting you there. So buy those raffle tickets. Randy, yes. when, when the discussion yeah. was about these direct drive turntables, it sounded to me like you were talking about a rotating magnetic field created by multi-phase AC. Is that true? Take it away. <laughs> well, there, it's a switching. It's a, it's a chip. They're using the same type of motor that was used in the, uh, in the CAT scan motors and VCRs, the multi-pole magnet. On a disc, yeah. The only difference between the Techniques motor and a, and a pancake motor from a VCR is the, the thickness of the product. Speed it up, okay. There, there Wrap are it up. fields okay. that are energizing, okay, you know, yeah. you know, exactly as you are pointing out, the only difference is how are they, uh, what are they using to pick up <laughs> the rotation speed and provide the correction. Okay. In the types you're speaking of, they actually use the a semiconductor that is actually looking at the various magnetic field differences in the rotating disk, which is the magnet. That's not, they're using coils in the Techniques product, not a little semiconductor yeah. looking at the magnet. I think Randy is getting kind of, hey, Randy, have you ever used sewing machine oil in these things? You can, but uh, most of them usually will say, uh, you know, Fram, red lithium grease, uh, or, uh, you know, white lithium grease. White lithium does tend to, does tend to be a little bit too light, but uh, 10W30 is actually recommended by this guy. He's done lots of these, and successfully, unlike myself. So, um, I go by his recommendations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you want a fairly heavy oil. You don't want something so thin. Oh, everything rotates fantastically, and you can feel how all the parts are meshing there must correctly. Be a million parts in there. Well, uh, probably not quite a million, but maybe you know a few hundred thousand. Did you ever come up with a solution to that odd uh, cartridge shoe where you're just losing a channel? There's a lot of resistance in that mm -hmm. in that uh, cartridge mounting head. I don't know why. Anyone didn't rework that in some fashion because that's the reason I throw them away. Yeah, a lot of people don't like the removable head shells that they have in these because, as Mike mentioned, they can kind of lose conductivity with the uh, with the little uh, connections that are in there. I haven't really had any problems with those, but that can be uh, an issue. You have to be careful. Depends on the output of the cartridge. Yes, yes. If you're, you're losing a using a low output ma magnetic cartridge, um, or, you, get, you get channel dropouts like. Because I had a, a freezer bag full of those little shoes, and I just threw it in the trash. Damn. Um, Anyhow, we got to wrap it up. Take the rest of the questions all time. We'll have to, if there's any other questions or discussions, we can talk about that outside here. Uh, Mike uh, has donated a cooler full of nice cold IPA out there, so we can sit on top of the cooler and <laughs> get busy. But uh, meanwhile, uh, if there are any other questions, uh, feel free to ask me while I'm around here. There's great resources to be had. Audio Karma, Lenco Heaven for the component type stuff. With these types of turntables, you can get good quality sound, particularly if you enter the raffle and win that ST70. All right?
That, let's wrap it up. Call it a day. Paul, let's get you going up here. Thank you. Thank you. Be wary of the crazy person with the microphone. <laughs> <laughs>